Welcome to the Cutting Edge Podcast, where culture meets crypto. Today, we have a former global head of digital marketing at Nike, Estee Lauder, and Revlon, and reigning queen of Clubhouse. She advises on strategy and marketing of NFTs and has worked with dozens of projects, including Adidas, Boss Beauties, and other blue chip projects, as well as several platforms. She's a founding member of BFF, whose mission is to democratize women's access to Web3. She is the most sought after female speaker on NFTs, specializing in helping companies enter Web3 and helping projects scale. Please welcome Swan Sit. What's up, G-Money? Where culture meets crypto. I love it. (laughs) How are you? How are you doing? I'm good. I'm psyched to be here. You're one of my favorite people in this industry, really intelligent. So yeah, I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah, same, you know, and I know I flew into LA. We're filming this live in LA right now in a podcast studio. And uh, how long have you been in town for? Uh, since Thursday, okay, I came cool. here, I got invited to an Oscars gifting lounge, which Ooh. was fun. This like body bag. We went around and they were just filling it with like handbags, shoes, trips. So oh, LA is pretty really great jealous. so far. <laughs> I'm really jealous. My LA trip has not been that good, but it's okay. It's uh, just starting. It's, I got you. <laughs> it's been, uh, it's been a great experience. You know, I guess coming from the East coast, LA's, I haven't been here in like a decade. So it's always like, uh, it's just like very different. Like the such vibe is just a, so different. Yeah. Such a culture shock. Yeah. Although I I will say is like, I love New York. I love how compact and close, like how dense everything is. So it's like, you know, you, you, how long did it take you to get here? An hour. I had five canceled Ubers. Now, granted, it's Oscar Sunday, so I didn't factor that into the mix. If you're not an L.A. person, you just don't understand what that means. Right. But I agree with you. Like I was a New Yorker 13 years. Everything was in stones throw or you could plan accordingly right here you're like well it might take me seven minutes or an hour and a half right yeah it's crazy (laughs) it's uh it's cool though i mean i guess you get better weather right so it's like you decide which one you want is better weather worth an hour and a half of traffic unclear i i I, i'm i'm a new yorker through and through but it's nice to be out here ditto but thank you for welcoming us la and uh we'll take it (laughs) yeah no it's it's been fun it's been fun for sure and I'm looking forward to NFT LA this week. So, oh my God, it's going to be such a fun event. Yes, it's in the sun, but I think some of our favorite friends in the industry are going to be here. And I think what's so great about conferences is that, yes, we do get to hear from speakers and what they're working on, but culture and community have to intersect in real life at some point. Mm-hmm. And so being able to give people a hug that you've been talking to online for a year feels so good. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Are you, are you speaking uh, on the panel? I am. I've got two, uh, both on Wednesday. One is about the balance between inclusivity and exclusivity in Web3. You need some exclusivity for people to want to have a board ape or a cool cat. But we say wag me. So let's have a real talk about what that really means. Mm -hmm. And then a woman's panel about how women are innovating in this space. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to that. I can't wait. So so yeah, so I guess with that, like I guess uh, while we start off here, let's talk about, I guess, how you came into the space. You know, you have a very corporate background and yet you were able to transition into Web3 very successfully. So why don't we get, you know, for those that aren't familiar with you, a little bit about your history and, and how you ended up in Web3? It's funny. It's, it's kind of an accident, but I don't know if there was a right way to come in because you ask anyone 20 years ago, Web3 wasn't even a figment of someone's imagination yet, right. right? So my background is corporate. I was the head of digital marketing globally for Nike, Revlon, Estee Lauder. About three years ago, I went independent. I now sit on public company boards. I advise a VC and a SPAC. I own an energy drink with some teenage TikTokers. And Clubhouse came about a couple years ago, smack in the middle of the pandemic. And for me, when Clubhouse launched, I was there May of 2020. It was early. And in those days, there was maybe 30 people on the app in any given one, in any given night. There was no rooms or programs. People just hung out. And for me, being an extrovert and being locked away for a year, it was such a great way to meet new friends, reconnect with old ones. And I genuinely like helping and connecting with people. So started in May of 2020. For a few months, it was still pretty quiet. But then late summer, the numbers started coming in. And part of it was helping, whether it's big companies going through digital transformation, which is what I did, or startups trying to scale, it was a really way to help people in mass. And then December rolled around I remember I hit 100,000 followers and it was such a wake up call because my social media was private up until then. I was corporate, so I had no aspirations for it. And just quietly, it kind of crept up because I'd help people with their business onboarding to Clubhouse. That's when I realized I had something. So from then on, December of 2020, I started doing regular programming, weekly shows, AMAs. 
And I talked with a freedom I never had in the corporate world. I'm super grateful for all my experiences in that in that part of my life. But now I can talk about racism and sexism, sexism in the workplace, innovation in ways that we couldn't have done with publicly traded companies. Um, people ask me about freezing my eggs or dating as an executive, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing was off limits. And in that year, it ended up going from in December to 100,000 to 3 million in May. So mm -hmm. it was overwhelming. It was such a gift, but it was crazy. And that's when I realized I actually hopefully do have a message to share. I have a platform now to do it. And as then NFTs had a moment on Clubhouse because I already had a platform there, I fell into it. I mean, the possibility of what NFT and blockchain technology can do for how we work, live, and play is limitless. It allowed me to be creative and to collaborate in ways I'd never been able to do before. But projects or platforms wanting an audience partnered with me to get their message out. And that's how I fell into it. And as you know, a lot of the PFP projects are marketing based. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. So now I ended up doing strategy and marketing for a lot of these projects. Cool. And what was, I guess, what was the first NFT that you bought? Ah, so there's a really funny story behind that one. So I heard about vFriends because Gary's been a, a friend and mentor for years. And I heard about vFriends. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. So I wasn't quite early enough. Even though I'd been hosting rooms and educating, I hadn't done my own purchases. So my first purchase was supposed to be a vFriend. It already minted. So I had to. That was in like May, right? May exactly. Okay. So a little after that, probably June, mm -hmm. I was trying to wrap some weath to go bid on one because I was like, well, the buy now is so expensive. I can get a deal with bidding, not understand the challenges of using Weath and bidding on OpenSea. And I wrapped some ETH and I got stuck. And it just got stuck in the wallet. And there's no help desk. Yeah. There's nobody to call. And the Web2 version of me was like, I have to fix this. There's like thousands of dollars sitting there. The Web3 version of me is like, okay, okay unclog it, push something else through or move on. Right. But I spent months trying to untangle that wallet. And in that time frame, BeFriend shot up in price. All these things passed me by. By then, I wanted my first NFT to be really special. And since it couldn't be a sweet swan from BeFriends, uh, one of our dear friends on Clubhouse, Wolf X Lion Jin, passed away from uh, the pandemic. And somebody had created kind of commemorative NFT series with his image and likeness. And I wanted that to be my NFT. I held that and that became my first NFT in that wallet. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, and right. forever, it's my first one ever and it'll always stay there. Right, I guess, so that's an amazing story, but I guess to rewind for a second, what ended up, hap um, what happened to the, to, to the, the ETH? Yeah. yeah, so it sat there and somebody sa finally said, just try to basically push more ETH through uh -huh. and do something with it or try to bid on something and it unclogged it, which I didn't realize was a thing. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, and now it, I don't bid on anything because what I didn't realize is when you bid on something and even if you're the clearing winning bid, the seller doesn't have to accept that even if you've met the, the reservation price, which is right. insane to me. That's not how real auction mechanics work. Right. So now I don't bid on anything. And that was a tough lesson learned because I lost three months in there. Right. Okay. All right. That's cool. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's the interesting thing with that, right? Is like a lot of people are like, oh, where are we in the adoption curve? Right. And I'm like, we are in the internet like in 1993, right? Like you have to be, you still have to be a pretty technical person, right? Like you, in 1997, 98, that's like around when I first started the internet. And that was like America Online and CompuServe and like those things where it's like, there was some sort of curated version of it. But like up until like before that, like you had to kind of like understand tech, right? And that's kind of what happened to you where it's like, all right, well, somebody gave you advice and you're like, okay, I'll try that. There's no like, hey, like customer service, like I need help with this or, you know, like Facebook is so intuitive at this point, right? Where it's like you press something and like the button does what you think it should do and not where it's like, all right, well, I have to, you know, go one, two and three steps like to get there, right? Totally. I mean, you're exactly right. Remember the CD-ROMs we used to do and like dial up and ee, that's those days. And if your CD-ROM was scratched, you couldn't do anything. Right. And that's what we're in now. It's so counterintuitive when you're like, I lost thousands of dollars trying to do something. I'm going to throw more money at something that's broken, right? right? But that's what unclogged it. And so what's so important about the early days of this is how collaborative and educational the community is. Mm -hmm. Because we're not going to get the documentations that we need from these platforms. Even if they create them, they're out of date in two weeks. Right. So we have to help each other get through this. And that's the one unique difference between Web 2 and Web 3 I haven't seen um, happen before. Like People joke that I spent my whole career convincing people Web 2 existed and I have to tell them Web 3 doesn't exist. The mm -hmm. internet doesn't exist. Right. But it's a different tenor 
the collaboration and education is so much more um, ground up and, and natural for right. this generation. That's the one thing I think will be significantly different. Right. Yeah. It, and I think it's really interesting because I think as you like see these communities develop and there needs to be this um, like support desk of some sort. And right now it's Discord. But I there I have to think that there's going to be like a better support system that comes out kind of like Zendesk started like existing for web two companies where it's like you can just go on chat and people start responding to you. There's going to be some sort of crypto native version of that that I think needs to come in order for adoption to happen. Right. Because you have to make it as seamless as possible when there is that situation where somebody is like, oh, like because that happens to me, too, all the time where a transaction gets stuck and I'm like, all right, like I need to like reset my wallet or, you know, like there's like a couple things that you do in your settings where like even sometimes I'm like, I don't know if this is going to work. I hope it does. And like, you know, if it doesn't, like at least I have my seed phrase and I can like reload my wallet. Right. Right. But that's not that's, an, but, that's yeah. not an effective troubleshooting right. strategy. And even beyond that, when we follow the steps, did it come from a reputable source? Right. right? Yeah. Because that's the other thing. Right. Right. That's al always like, I, you know when you know you go into a discord chat or a telegram chat and this is like buyer this is literally like tips safety for like how to stay safe is you're gonna get dm'd if you go into somebody's discord or their telegram and you're like hey guys like this isn't working can i get help with this you're gonna get a, a bunch of dms and people are like oh yeah like you know they're gonna act like they're part of tech support and they might even like have the same name as one of the founders or whatever um, and they're going to try to kind of like hack you or like steal your passcode, your seed phrase, whatever it is um, to try to, to figure it out. And like, meanwhile, I think what ends up happening in those situations, I know because I've been there is where like you're so desperate for that help. And then you're like, OK, like, you know, it's like, you know, somebody grabs you a life, um, a life raft and you, you're going to grab onto it instinctually. Right. Instinctively. And so like that's something I think it's like one of those like social engineering hacks, right? Where yeah. people like prey on you when you're like, oh yeah, like I definitely need help from somebody. You listen to them and it's like, oh shit, I should not have done that, right? And these scammers are smart, right? They understand human nature very well. So for example, I'm on publicly traded boards. Mm -hmm. I People know I cannot be shady in anything. So guess what? Even if I don't have a lot of followers, I get a lot of imposter accounts because people know my audience trusts me. Oh, she's on public tra traded boards. She's not going to do anything shady. So when she says, go do something, go buy this, go trade this, it's got to be safe. Right. So these scammers prey on the things that are the most vulnerable, which makes it so tricky. And I think in order for the help to get better, there's there's two things. There needs to be infrastructure so that we don't click on a random help article that was mass as, you know. Mm -hmm. So I always triple check everything, right? When you check Twitter, you check yeah. you know, the website, you check Discord. And even if somebody says, go do this, sometimes I'll Google that problem and see if some of those keywords show up yeah. in someone else's help things kind of 101 but we forget to your point not only because we're we're desperate but a lot of times these drops are so time sensitive you don't have time to check for right. things and that's how they get you yeah right so we need infrastructure where it's easy to put the things in the right places either it's with the companies that are you know doing the troubleshooting or a community where we are the participants in it mm -hmm. but the other piece that i don't think we do a good job of is like we're so good on incentives and in certain things like auction mechanics and drops having people grind for whitelist, whether you like it or not, or allow lists. We're good at incentives, but we don't put incentives in there for people to help each other or to offer up documentation. Right. Imagine if we had a community pool for this, a DAO came up, and maybe like everyone who contributes to the help desk or validates other people's help desk stuff gets to earn from that. I would contribute to I, that. I think there's some communities that have tried doing it, right? Where it's like, make the documentation and you get like some tokens. But I agree with you, like there needs to be some sort of maybe allocation that goes for people that are going to be like mods or, you know, but I, I, it's a double edged sword, right? Cause some people just want that in token. Some people want it in USDC. Right. So sure. it's going to exist, but I think we're still, still so early days in all of yeah. this that um, I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not, neg I'm, I'm very bullish on us coming up with like a solution. Agreed. You know? Agreed. But I do think it takes us taking a pause from all the drops and the flips and the mints to actually say we want to build it. And to be honest, that's not as lucrative as launching a product, a project and making $4 million. Right. So the incentives are grossly misaligned for people to do the hard work. Right. Well, I mean, I think hopefully a bear market kind of cures that, right, to, to some sort of extent. We saw that with crypto, I think, last cycle where uh, in the bear market, like that topped in 2018 and then started again in probably 2020 is that's where a lot of like 
the building and the innovation started happening. So I think we're probably going to see that in the NFT market as well, where it's no longer uh, as lucrative to be like, you know, get somebody on Fiverr, mint a PFP project, make a couple million dollars and then like disappear. Um, it becomes more like more rewarding and you're going to make more money by building a protocol that people actually use, right? Like building some sort of help desk protocol that like, you know, 80% of communities use it, then you're going to be doing pretty well, right? Yeah, I like that idea. Communities, but also the platforms that are generally the ones who have the issues, right? right. Helping them fund into it. Right. I agree. I might take the bear, but ICOs went through that, but also dot com went through that. I mean, mm -hmm. 2000 was a massive crash because those valuations were escalating out of control. And I think every time we have something that runs too hot, when you have a little bit of a crash, people build more for the long term. Right. And I look forward to that. Right. Yeah. So am I. I that's one of the things that I've definitely uh, have been looking forward to. I, I, I made a joke, I think, two or three weeks ago where like I finally caught up to like most of my messages after like after like 18 months of being like, OK, like things have slowed down a little bit. Right. Like not entirely, but like enough where I'm like, I'm not three weeks behind on when people pinging me on stuff. Where I'm like, oh, yeah, like we spoke a month ago. Yeah, I was supposed to get back to you. Right. And, and that to me tells me that we're probably in that building phase right now. Which makes me bullish. I haven't hit that. I would love to borrow whatever techniques or team you've got <laughs> to catch up. But maybe you're right. But also, I think we all get to a point where we just have to let go of the FOMO. You're never going to get every mint or every project. You're never going to get every flip. So when you accept that and you're like, okay, maybe I will take, and this is what I did the past month. I've been on the road traveling around the world doing talks, building projects. I missed every big mint. And guess what? I'm still okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So sometimes it may be just a personal choice to say in my journey, I'm going to fork here and make sure I have that balance, because right. if I'm continuing to chase and I'm always in a state of stress, I'm probably not building right either. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you. I think that was one of those things I've, I've made a very deliberate decision, probably six, seven, eight months ago, maybe a little bit longer where I'm not like the best use of my time is not minting projects. Right. Yeah. The best of use of my time is how can I help disruption and increase adoption? And so it's like, you know, I could do that. And, I, you know, I think I'd like to think I'm doing a pretty good job of that. Or I could sit there and be in front of my computer and be like, all right, I need to catch every mint. I need to flip them and this and that. And it's just not what I want to do. Right. So um, I think people just kind of need to do that. It's like you can't do everything like I can't yield farm in DeFi. I just don't have the time to do it. It's not a good use of my time. Yeah. And I think to your point is like people just need to be okay. Like you can't have that FOMO, right? You have to be okay with missing certain things, but understand that there are certain things that you might be good at and really just lean into it and like take advantage of it. Yeah. And I think everyone has to go through that personal journey too. I mean, we met on Clubhouse in some of those late night rooms about NFTs, what, like a year ago or something like that. I mean, back then I remember hosting like Paris Hilton and Edward Snowden and it was just like this incredible Floyd Mayweather, right? Those People have done multiple projects since. The iterations of projects have changed so much. So arguably, if I hadn't gone through this year cycle, year and a half, I probably wouldn't be at this like state of slight calm. Mm -hmm. But I think everyone has to go through the fire for a few months. I mean, you can't right. help it. It's, I think, initiation for some people. Right. No, I, I totally agree. Right. And I so I guess one of those things that like I would love to to touch upon for a second is, you know, women in the space. Yeah. Right. You're a female in the space. You're a minority female in the space. Um, you like you said earlier, like everything and every way everyone comes into the space a little bit differently. I guess what are some things that we as a space could be doing better to help bring more females and minorities into the space? The culture is intimidating. As a tight knit culture, all the acronyms and jargon we use for a man or woman to come in as a newbie, it's really intimidating. But the energy can also be really alpha who screams the loudest. We're screaming, let's F and go. I mean, it's not the right, it's not the easiest place to onboard, especially if you're coming into a Twitter spaces or a clubhouse room and you've got hundreds of people there and you have a really dumb question. Chances are 30 other people are wondering the same thing, but to be the guinea pig or sacrificial lamb, you feel stupid. Mm -hmm. So I think first is creating a culture that's much more welcoming, inclusive, and educational and no dumb questions. I was running a room a couple of weeks ago and somebody went and bought an NFT from that project, not realizing the project hadn't minted yet, so obviously bought a fake. Mm -hmm. It became an incredible teaching moment. She was so embarrassed. And I was like, no, 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 it's okay. We'll make you whole. In fact, then the project stepped up. It was like, we'll not only make you whole, we'll give you some 
when we go to Mint, but then we walked everyone through basic wallet security and what a Mint is, et cetera. We get sometimes so busy chasing the bag, we don't stop and realize there needs to be off-ramps sometimes to have sidebars on that stuff. We're the, Even the best of us get had, mm-hmm. right? Somebody just had their wallet wiped for a million and a half the other day. And that's somebody really experienced in this space. So I think creating an inclusive space, taking the time to educate, that's number one. Number two, for women specifically, though, they have different investment styles than men. And I think it's shown that some women invest better than men on a longer term strategy. So if you're looking for a quick flip, I think of it like a trading floor on Wall Street, right? It's very masculine, male, fast and gut. Women tend to be really good at strategy or looking at teams and roadmaps and assessing them. So I think this will naturally happen anyway as we move away from the quick mint flips because I think we're going to start running out of some of those opportunities if a bear market hits. I think looking at how women invest or appealing to certain things that female investors want to invest in, really positive for projects. But the third thing is, and I commend you because, Jimena, you're the one who brought me into the Adidas and Board Apes conversation, creating opportunities for women. Mm -hmm. Right. Women, people of color, people at the margin, whether it's by gender, race or socioeconomic status. Right. I always tell people when I when I do a talk, they said, what do you want people to go buy or do or sell? I said, actually, I'm not selling anything. But if you learn something cool, go tell five other people. And it's five people who don't look, act or sound like you. Because that's the only way we start breaking it through. If we only tell people who are in our circles, it doesn't get to the margins. We feel like we're educating and helping, but we're not actually doing it. So I say do it in a clubhouse or spaces. Do it to people who are just genuinely curious. But if we don't take steps of reaching out to people we don't know that well, like you did with me, how are we ever going to change that landscape? Right. It's simple. It's actually not that hard. It just takes concerted effort to stop and think about it. Right. And I guess a follow up to that, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about lately is right. You said you said earlier, like how do you know, women find projects, they have certain characters, characteristics that they look for in a project. Right. But like the question I have for you is like, how can a project invite women into? Right. Like, Because it's like so let's say um, I, what would you think is the percentage of women in the space? Oh, it's 5%. 5%. Okay. Yeah, crypto is 81% male and NFTs is 95% male. Okay, so then it's really like if you had a 10% female uh, to male collector in your ratio in your project, right? That would be over-indexing for females, right? And you, But the goal is to obviously try to get to as much as close to 50-50 as possible. What is it that projects can do to help bring in more females, right? Like into their project on the mint thing? On, on the mint day? So it starts actually even before the mint day mm. uh, or even before looking at who's holding your NFTs. It starts much earlier. So when you develop the project, having female minds and voices on the team, instead of having the same project that could be marketed to males, you could like sneaker culture, right? We market to males, but a lot of women love sneakers. But when they make female sneakers, they pink it and shrink it. Women like cool, bold color sneakers. It doesn't have to be pink. So having people in the room to raise their hand and be like, actually, the women don't need a pink version. We like this too. But you need to speak to us differently because we'll care about different things. Mm -hmm. So from the conception of the project, even if it's not on the team, but at least having a small focus group of people you can talk to that represent diverse voices and interests just makes your customer base broader. That's just good for right. your business. It's good for business. Right? <laughs> yeah. Then as we host clubhouse rooms and spaces, which is where a lot of this activity happens when we start building community and interest in a project, include women on those stages. And I know it's a little harder because if you look at the audience and if it's reflective of 90% males and 10% females, there's maybe not as many women to bring up on stage. Bring them up because, again, when we think about the questions people ask, it's probably the same questions over and over. Mm-hmm. Bring women up to have those voices. Maybe they'll ask the t- question in a different way or new questions, right? We kind of sometimes bring the same people we know and trust, but the different voices actually, I would argue, add richer conversations. This is what I've been doing is social audio, right? The more different, the better the conversation is. Um, and then I would think about, you know, one of the things that people do, obviously, when you launch a project, you've got an allow list, you partner with other projects. Hit up the women's projects. What I've been so impressed with are women who are ready to spend money who aren't targeted or approached. 
there's like a gold mine. You're looking at men flipping the same projects over and over and they buy and they dump, which does havoc to your floor price. Mm. There's a lot of women with a lot of cash to spend and looking for ways to park it. And they may not even flip as much. Who knows? Right. I'm being a little stereotypical based <laughs> on Wall Street, you know, and right. how those genders invest differently. But if you want community builders, I mean, there's um, a, an organization called Barefoot College in Africa. And they train mothers and grandmothers to be the teachers in the villages, even though the teaching jobs tend to go to men. Mm -hmm. But what happens is men are taught how to teach. Then they go to the cities for the better paying jobs. Mothers and grandmothers don't leave their families. Mm -hmm. They stay in the communities. They're the community builders. So if you look at back at like archaeological history, these have been the pillars of communities. Get more women in. Give them voices. Even give them roles. Unofficially even just to even hold spaces on top of it, then you end up having a better mix of voices. Again, good for business, but also just makes a better product and community. Right. And I guess with that, I'd love to touch on BFF. So BFF mm -hmm. is a female focused community, right? Yes. Is it only females? No, uh, different people are welcome, but okay. the focus for the benefit is for women and non-binary people. Okay. Uh, but because, you know, 81% of crypto is male, you can't tell me women aren't interested or aren't intelligent enough to understand it, but we tell people who look and act like us. So if we don't extend to them, then they get left out. So the entire mission of BFF, which Britt Morin and Jamie Schmidt founded, they're two entrepreneurs, is to use a diverse group of founding members and a larger membership. I mean, we had 25,000 people sign up for our initial broadcast, but to teach them and turn them into evangelists to teach others. And it's to source opportunities, source education so that people, if they want to, they can raise their hand and say yes. Because if you don't know about it, there's no way you can participate. And if someone tells me to go try this restaurant that, I, you know, it's a trip advisor review or someone I barely know, I probably won't go do it. But if you tell me to go eat at that restaurant and I know you have good taste in food, I'm probably more likely to do it. Right. It's that kind of daisy chain of trust that we're hoping to leverage upon, but with a concerted lens of being more conscious of bringing people in the margins into the fold. Right. So, yeah, the founding members are all women. It's geared towards women and non-binary, but we want everyone to participate. Like a lot of our bracelet holders, people who bought them on the secondaries, they're mm -hmm. men. And by the way, the bracelets were a free airdrop that are worth 0.8 today. Right. That's incredible value based on the mission and the promise of what this org can achieve. And we have a lot of male allies and we couldn't do it without them. Right. Yeah. And how big is how many, I guess, NFTs are there outstanding? Like at the moment. So the BFF bracelets, there's I think about 7,000. Okay. And that was a free airdrop to people to a selection that came to the opening launch. Right. Those will be access gates to other launches and other partnerships, but it's just a token of early membership. Right. The actual NFT drop is coming soon, which you'll have to stay tuned for. Okay, cool. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, you know, so one of the things that, you know, we've been on a few panels, right? And uh, we've always talked about our concerns of pitfalls that could be coming in the metaverse. Yeah. Right. What can you describe to us like what some of those concerns are? One thing that confuses me about the metaverse is that it's free from the confines of geography and gravity. So when I hear we're hiring famous architects in the real world to come design in the metaverse, I'm like, why? I don't care about actually science. I care about experience and beauty. I would hire kids and Imagineers to design buildings that go upside down or sideways or move, right? So first is like just letting go of what physical design looks like in a metaverse where the world is limitless. Hmm. Secondly is why physical boundaries or plots of land matter. Right. I mean, yes, maybe the first time my avatar wanders into a metaverse, she'll walk around, she'll see what's hanging up. But after the first few times, it's going to get old. If I can type a web address to go to a website in one click, why would my avatar walk across town for three hours to get to something cool? Mm -hmm. You would hopefully just be able to one click go there. It seems incredibly inefficient. Right. So location and proximity to cool doesn't matter to me. In fact, if there's a cool board apes party and let's say meta is rich enough to buy all the land surrounding board apes. If I want to go to that party and I can't get in with the apes, am I going to go to the Facebook company public uh, picnic just because it's next door? Right. No. So I think the metaverse should be designed for experiences. And that's what you're doing and who you're doing it with. That's what we're going to spend time there for. It's already clunky where we have to maybe wear a headset or be on a 2D screen. So it's going to have to be really dope for me to actually want to spend time in this virtual world, right? We're not at Ready Player One and we may never 
may never be fully there, but it's got to be cool. And what makes it cool? What I get to do and who I get to do it with. Right. So I think it's not only cool to maybe think about designing um, experiences that might change or maybe even like there's a company that designs experiences that rents it out to different properties so like maybe if you've got an nft project one week you're renting out a space for a carnival another week you're renting out a virtual experience for a concert but it's plug and play because it's code you don't actually have to build it and then imagine if my neighbors are not bound by physical borders like if i have a square pot of land why is it four neighbors that border it it's limitless. Why couldn't I go three or 40? Why couldn't I have 15 neighbors on top of each other? And maybe neighbors shouldn't be geographical borders, but should be my social graph of who my homies are. Right. So if my neighbors are my best friends and their neighbors are their best friends, I'm much more interested in meeting my neighbors of neighbors because it's our social graph. Mm. Like, I'm so curious who your neighbors would be. And if you're my neighbor, of course, I'd want to know who shares your border. Right. Not because who bought the real estate in town, but because that's who you spend your time with. Right. No, I, I totally agree with you. I think that the notion of digital scarcity is bullshit, right? Yeah. And so like when, when you take that and you apply it to, like I understand if like you're playing a game, right? And the map needs to be a certain way and these are the rules of the game and like you need to do X, Y, and Z in order to win the game or to advance to the next level. That makes sense, right? I understand scarcity in that sense. But like if I'm going to create this, let's call it a conference room, right? A virtual conference room where you're going to come in and we're going to have our meetings in there. Kind of like a Zoom meeting, right? Like mm -hmm. imagine if like you can only, uh, you had to purchase your Zoom meeting up in advance and then each one, each Zoom additional Zoom conference meeting after that becomes more expensive, right? Mm -hmm. And that to me is kind of like the structure of these maps that um, they could have historical relevance because they were some of the first metaverses on blockchain. Sure. But I just don't think that we're going to be necessarily transacting in there long term right because the same thing with instagram right if every uh every uh instagram profile was consequentially more expensive mm. like instagram would have never gone viral right like it's the fact that instagram has gone viral is because it's so easy to create new profiles right and yeah. that's that's why we're all there so i i think the same thing is like why would you implement this thought of scarcity into something that's not scarce, right? Like exactly. to, to create a, a room or a world, uh, your own metaverse, like is literally just a click of a button. So we should allow people to run with that imagination. And to your point, right, is like, if I create this amazing uh, experience or this amazing location, then maybe you could come in and be like, oh yeah, like I'll rent it out for the day because I wanna throw a party there, right? And that's where I think the value of Cruel will ultimately be is having people be super creative and then creating an economy for those creatives and not necessarily creating an economy for like investors. Totally. Because if we push scarcity, which agreed, like in a game, scarcity makes sense because there's winners and prizes. Mm -hmm. The metaverse is not supposed to have winners and losers. It's supposed to be whatever we want to build in it. And if we then use the same confines of scarcity to charge more for a specific pot plot of land, all you do is now bias the winners of Web 2 as winners of Web 3. And if you couldn't afford the physical plot of land in Beverly Hills and Web 2, you probably can't afford Main Street and Web 3. But isn't that what we're trying to change? Right. I mean, I was at Nike and I was in sneaker culture for a long time. When you only make 10,000 pairs of shoes, it's plant scarcity. You absolutely could make 300,000 pairs. But guess what? That makes people want it. Mm -hmm. And I think to some extent, when you create community, there has to be some fences around to make it culture. Like culture can't be everything to everyone because... Mm -hmm. That's not one culture. That's just who we all are. And that's beautiful. But you've got to put some stakes in the ground for that. There's still a balance, though, because as we talk about the metaverse, I was told, OK, well, no, you don't have to walk across town. You can use tubes. I'm like, why can't I fly? Why can't mm -hmm. I ride my Jadu hoverboard? Right. Why do I have to take tubes? It's not the subway in London. Right. So, you know, I think, yes, having a historical place to be first is important. But ask Friendster and MySpace how important that was. Right. Exactly. You know, uh, you said something really interesting. I want to dissect it for a second. Yeah. About uh, scarcity, right? And let's say Nike and sneaker culture, like 10,000 sneakers and 300,000. What are your thoughts on that, right? Because I, especially as a lot of brands are starting to come into the Web3 world and, you know, a lot of these products will be digital going forward, right? Or more, we'll have more digital products going forward. But a brand has a certain thing, you know, they have a certain narrative 
that they want to keep up, right? And I think part of the reason why Nike was very successful was that, you know, secondary volume of streetwear culture and like sneakers kind yeah. of like getting really hyped up. And, you know, that's like a lot of marketing that marketing dollars can't buy, right? What are your thoughts on that with regards to scarcity in like the metaverse and like Web3 and like how brands are approaching it, what you think it are the right things they're doing, the wrong things they're doing, and just thoughts in general on that? Scarcity is only relevant when it's cool. Right. If something's scarce, but you don't want it, you don't care. Right. So it's the combination of the, those two things, which is why often in sneaker culture, scarcity comes with unique collaborations. It's not just a cool shoe. It's a cool shoe with somebody that isn't in shoes and you can only get it once. So that's the magic ingredient for that. And there's a necessary level of that to create desire and hype, because if it's readily available, we're very predictable humans. If I can buy it tomorrow as easily as I can buy it next year. There's no urgency. Mm -hmm. right? This is marketing 101 from like dark ages, right? You know, <laughs> the Don so, Draper days. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I think there needs to be a healthy amount of it in Web3 to the point of where we can help people make decisions that, you know, help them identify with a culture or a tribe or a brand. But hopefully it's not through just financial me mechanisms of exclusivity. Hmm. So as we see, actually, I love that you mentioned it. Like sneaker culture is a nice adjacency to web brands entering the uh, web three world because it's community it's culture it's inclusion and i don't know if there's a right way to do this but i do love how both adidas and nike have come in um adidas did it more organically they bought an ape they partnered with you punks comic apes etc and it was a slower coming into integration and they've tried other nft projects they're trying to educate their executives nike aped in and bought artifact mm -hmm. remains to be seen which one works and also both can work i don't think there's right. one right answer to this but what i don't think works is when you just slap a brand on an nft as a collectible and expect it to sell that's my most challenging conversation is a celebrity or a big brand will tell me i hear nfts are lucrative help me make one right that's yeah, no, i don't I, even I, I, it's i'm sure you get that too all the time and it's the most frustrating conversation because my thing i always challenge back is like if i remove nft and we try to sell this in fiat would people buy it right and it's yeah. usually a no. And if it's a no, then you shouldn't do it, right? And I get those conversations all the time where people hit me up and like, oh, or like, especially the ones that I really don't like is last second, they'll hit me up. They're like, oh, our NFT is dropping next week. Like, you know, we want to come on the show. We want to promote it. Will you help promote it? I'm like, I mean, first, like, tell me your concept, right? Because it's like, I, I want to be doing stuff that's cool and innovative and, and pushing it forward. Um, but if it's not like i don't necessarily want to be involved right it feels like a cash grab right and those are the things that um i i want to stay away from right because i know what my intentions are and i want to make sure that i'm helping brands come in in a very authentic way agreed and i would argue that most brands couldn't command a collectible right. i actually get really excited thinking about like supply chain and CRM, like changing how fundamentally businesses work. Mm -hmm. So in sneaker culture, for example, all the time we see aftermarket sales, sometimes you're not sure if it's authenticated or if they are through GOAT or StockX, you're paying a premium for it. Imagine if we could put an NFC chip in a shoe and we tracked it, you know, what factory it was made in, which worker walk, worked on it, even the environmental footprint from that day. But we know which truck it fell off of to end up in the back of someone's car mm -hmm. being sold, and you're not even sure if it's real, but we could track it, distributor, retailer, owner, resale value. So now we actually know what true market value for products is. That would change supply chain so yeah, dramatically, right? Sure. You know where every product is and you know it's authenticated. So consumer and company are both happy. And then so much happens on this aftermarket for sneakers. If you have money, you're not waking up at 7 a.m. Pacific on Saturday to hit six devices to try to win the sneakers drop for Nike. You're buying aftermarket for maybe 10x the price. Right. Nike has no idea who that is. But imagine if you look in a wallet and you saw 30 pairs of rare Jordans in there. That's a valuable consumer. Airdrop them something. Start a relationship. So that's the stuff I get more excited about. And the brands that are open to thinking that way are the ones I'm bullish on because it's not a collectible for a fast cash grab. Maybe there's a collectible in terms of a membership. That's the one way I think it actually kind of works quite well. But I'm more interested in how this act ties into community, loyalty, advocacy, and full value spectrum of the company. That's where I think those will win. Right. And yeah, we, we need to talk offline about this because we're 
we're definitely seeing eye to eye on this. Love but. it. You're one of the few because everyone's chasing the collectible. I'm like when that bear hits, these are, I love our JPEGs and I'm kind of being facetious, but they don't have under, like, un, underlying market value. I mean, you used to be in finance, right? right? If a company goes out of out of business, we can sell the stock or license the IP, sublease the buildings. If one of these projects rugs or crashes, right, have got yeah, a cute JPEG. Exactly, right? And and yeah, it's funny because that's like kind of like the culture, right? It's like when roadmap, like when token drop, when all this stuff. So it's been... Uh, I, I think it's the the industry is definitely going to be evolving over the next few months uh, and years for that matter. But but it goes yeah. back to your question of being stewards of not only being analytical, mm -hmm. self-critical, even sometimes of our own of our own culture. Like this is why we can't have nice things like we've got to <laughs> preserve it. But it's also solutions builders. Mm -hmm. OK, so we identify this problem. Who am I going to build this with? And I think that's the most fun part of it. Right. Yeah. And, you know, with that, we'll we'll end this part of the segment. Because uh, I think this was great, but I think uh, next up, we've got the rapid the rapid questions, which I think will be a lot of fun, too. Let's do it. So now we'll go into a new segment we're working with here called Rapid Fire, where we each have 60 seconds to answer questions that uh, we source from Twitter. The ones that are picked will get a special pull-up for the interview. Are you Ooh, ready, Swan? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. So the first question we have is for St. Pablo NFT. He asks, what parts of your former job as a digital marketer at a big Web2 company are similar to Web3, and what are some of the differences? Oh, such a good question. The most similar piece of both, it's about people. Marketing is about product customer fit. What do people want, and how do we aspire to get them there? That's the most similar thing. And humans are frustratingly predictable, so with the right incentives, you can get them to actually do whatever behavior. The difference, the speed, the product, the infancy of the infrastructure and support. I mean, those are fundamentally different. But when you get people excited about a pair of Jordans or an NFT drop, it is the same childish look in their eyes. It does not matter. Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think um, one of the things that I, I see is like the biggest difference is just the time that people want. Like they're like, oh, like I bought this yesterday, like create value tomorrow. Right. Insane. And it's like nothing works like that. Not like no. nothing. Right. If you want something good. It takes time. Of course, somebody can get you something really quick, but it's not going to be good. And like you want a quality product and you want to have something that you're really happy about. Like it takes time. Right. And that to me has been I think uh, I'm sure you're privy to a lot of these conversations as well, where like creators just get frustrated. Right. Yep. Because I think most industries out there move at a rapid pace. Right. Because everyone, you know, I think it's just very well, like that's just how humans operate. Right. Like you want to be first to market. You want to innovate. You want to do all these cool things. So everybody's always working at top speed. But I feel like in Web3, it's like put that in hyperdrive and people expect like the best stuff in the world immediately right after. And, and, and like it's just I think it's frustrating. I don't I don't think it's sustainable. And I think we're going to have like the pendulum swing the other way. Right. Where. You even saw this in in 2017 where, OK, you had the ICO boom. You had a huge pullback. People built stuff during those two years. And it really came to fruition in 2020 when it started to really take on a life of its own. And I, I think the same thing is going to happen in the NFT space. I mean, we have to like slow down a little bit on expectations because I do think it's it's very like frustrating for creators. Well, creators often these projects are a dev and an artist and all of a sudden they're running a multi-million dollar company overnight so they've got to staff up a team and learn how to grow up but it's also like your shareholders are also your customers and they're in a rabid angry mob so the more forgiveness we can give to these projects to actually i mean how long even the apple and nike are massively fast successes yeah. still took decades right yeah exactly Okay. okay, you guys are breaking my rules already. I know, but I can't. He's so <laughs> smart. Exactly. I love this. <laughs> all right, all right. We're going to go to the next one, all right? Okay, G-Money. Adam Brotman asks, what do you think the biggest challenge is to brands adopting a Web3 digital engagement strategy? Um, so from the conversations I've had, I think the number one thing is brands have been taught over the last 10, 15 years that they want to have all the information on all their customers, right? Including their name, their date of birth, what they do, all these things, right? And to me, they're like, oh, well, how do we do this and then get them onto our, you know, email platform mm -hmm. or whatever? And I'm like, 
Well, that defeats the purpose. You don't want to do that, right? Because like at the end of the day, like you want to get to a point, and this is exactly to the the example you did earlier, where it's like you want to see what's in their wallet, and you don't really need to know what their name is or what their occupation is, or if they're a male or a female. You can kind of we will get to a point where you'll be able to tell, right, just by looking at their wallet. And then also like if they own thirty pairs of Jordans, you know that they're a very valuable client to you and you can interact with that without having to know who they are. Right. And that goes back to like the privacy thing uh, of why we ended up here. Right. Like, because we always felt that our privacy was always invaded. So I like, to me, that's always like the pushback where I'm like, well, you're thinking about it wrong. Right. Like you, and you have to change your paradigm of how you think about it in before you can really begin to engage with the consumer in Web3. Couldn't agree more. Flip the script. In fact, Brands have to earn the right to know who you are because your wallet's the fullest representation of who you are. It'll have the products or projects you like, the places you went and PO apps that you got. That is a rich trove of information. It's mm -hmm. our wallet. It might be transparent on the blockchain, but I don't have to tell you it's mine. Right. So now if a brand wants to know, well, what are you going to do to earn that? And I love because now the power is actually going back to the consumer. It's never been the case. Right. I totally agree. Awesome. So Danny BLT NFTS, what brands are great examples that are making the transition into Web3 and why? I talked a little bit about Adidas and Nike before. I think streetwear is a really nice jump over into this, but streetwear brands like Bobby Hundreds and what he did with Adam Bomb Squad, slow, methodical build, really focusing on community. I think that's going to be a long run win. Um, I like what Gucci did with Super Plastic. Partnerships are always great. Leverage the collectibles version of it. Um, you know, Budweiser was interesting because to be fair, I didn't buy any, but I've been watching what big brands do. Their first one, I was like, do I want a Bud Can NFT? Not really. Mm -hmm. The second one was interesting because it basically was emerging artists that you could buy the NFTs from with Budweiser. Now, I think it could have been marketed better to think about gamification, but instead of buying Bud, which is very web to, I'm a brand, it's egocentric, we're betting on these emerging artists for the future. See what you can collect and let's see what happens, right? Because you might end up having that Mickey Mantle rookie card 10 years later of somebody who is a char chart topper. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a more interesting approach. Um, you know, I think Sports Illustrated coming back with, they did it on one of's platform, but they brought back iconic covers from history. So instead of selling a collectible for future subscriptions, no one's buying magazines anymore. Right. They went back to the history covers that we know and love of all the greats of sports. Mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali, um, Jerry Rice, etc. They put those covers into digital NFT art form and brought it back and brought the athletes back onto like Twitter spaces to talk to us about like their experiences. Emmett Smith, Jerry Rice, like talking about the pool shot where he's on the cover instead of being on the field, he was in a swimming pool. Right. So that was really smart too, right? Because I think, you know, it was an accessible way for people not into the NFT culture to come in. But it brought back athletes that made, made us nostalgic about our childhood. Mm -hmm. I like those coming in, but I don't know if anyone's truly nailed it yet, to be honest. I think to do it, you'd have to have it either fully integrated to consumer experience. So possible metaverse, possible retail sales, et cetera, but possibly even into, like we said before, supply chain and customer data. Right. We haven't seen a perfect one yet. Right. I, I, I agree with you. I think that the uh, brands that are coming into the space that are focused on building with the community are definitely the ones that you're seeing uh, be very successful. I do think that some of these brands that are coming into the space, you can see sometimes that it's a very like not well thought out overall strategy where it's Cringe. like, all right, well, we want to be first. We want to like, we want to like make sure we do this before our competitor does this. Right. And you know, cause every category has like its top three or four uh, that are up there, but even like one and two, and it's usually like, oh, well we want to do this before X does it. And, I feel like because of that, sometimes you just start seeing them go down a road of like, oh, well, we didn't we, we wanted to do the first step, but we didn't really think about steps two, three and four. And like we're starting to see that play out now. And yeah. like really, you can tell that probably internally there maybe isn't a like head of metaverse, right? Or a head of Web3 the way there is for different verticals within within the company itself. And I think that will change, right? And I think part of that is because we're so early and I think a lot of companies were dipping their toes in to start and now they're starting to be like, okay, well, there is something here. This NFTs are not just a fad. We have to like really go gung-ho into this. But I think we're just in that part right now. 
we're breaking the rules because it's supposed to be rapid fire. Yeah. But <laughs> one of the things I learned in doing Web2 transformation is they'd be like, you're the head of digital. I'm like, at some point, it's not digital. It's not digital marketing. It's just marketing. Right. It's not e-commerce. It's sales. I love the day of thinking about instead of even having a head of metaverse, it's just like experience. Right. It doesn't matter where you are. Right. Someday. Yeah. Some, one of these days. Lisa's going to kill us. I know. <laughs> okay. Sean J. Coelho asks, what aspects of today's NFT culture will survive broader market adoption and which will disappear? So, you know, we just touched on this a little bit, right? Obviously, I think that the sense of entitlement is unsustainable. Mm -hmm. But I do think the sense of community building, wanting to work together, uh, at some point, I don't know exactly when it happened for me, but like having that mindset shift to abundance and wanting to help people, even if you don't directly benefit from it, um, is something that I hope survives and I think will survive because I think that is something that's very unique to crypto, right? Because the human experience is built on scarcity, right? Like for tens of thousands of years, yeah, everything was scarce, right? Yeah. Like to survive, like you needed to eat and there wasn't always endless supplies of food for everybody, right? But like, I think when you start swift, when you start shifting to this crypto mindset, and even what we were talking about with digital land, yep. right? It's like, it's not scarce. Digital land is no. a, a very, a not, nothing that's digital should be scarce, right? And so I think that that will start permeating over, um, I and I, I take that back for a second because there will be things that should be scarce. Yeah. But I'm just saying like, in, in general, like a pair of digital sneakers, there you know should be as many needed as people want whether or not you get them from like the brands that you want is a different story, right? Because that's where the scarcity comes into play. But I just think that that's something that will end up surviving is that sense of helping each other and that community building that like, I mean, as cheesy as it sounds like the whole wag me thing, right? Like we are going to make it and yeah. like we're going to make it together because we're helping each other. Scarcity sometimes uses a shortcut to culture, mm -hmm. right? By saying, well, these cool people have it. So sh you should want to be in the cool kids club. Mm -hmm kind of terrible when you're not in it, right? It's not very wag me. So I would argue the hard work of building community starts at the ground, grassroots, and it has to be consistent every day. Community is the intersection of two things. Commonality of purpose meets frequency of touch. You have to believe in the same thing and you have to interact often enough to feel included in the community. That's hard work from the ground up. So you think about the Women's March, commonality of purpose for sure, but we kind of did a few marches and it went away. Mm -hmm. So it was a movement, but not community. Instagram, we're on it 20 times a day. Frequency of touch is there, but it's every interest under the sun. There's sub-communities of food and travel and NFTs, but it's not a community. Instagram's a platform. You don't go to Instagram's Instagram account. You couldn't care less. Right. So I think, you know, instead of using scarcity as a shortcut, which I agree is necessary for some things as otherwise then it's everything to everyone and there's no identity, but having some stakes in the ground and using community, not just as commonality of purpose meets frequency of touch, but web three, allowing people to participate in the co-creation of it, which web two social media from brands didn't allow. That's how I think we build community. That's what's right. going to stay. So I agree with you. It's the elements of that, but a very intentional lens with it different from web two. So Danny VLT NFT again asks, what is the biggest misconception of learning about NFTs? And this is a general anyone's question. My favorite pushback to me is, but I can't touch it. And I'm like, but you don't need to be able to touch it. No, I do. Like I like having things in my home. So I've done this at a conference. I did it at South by as a at the keynote. I made everyone take out their phones and hold up their favorite photos. And of course you see like families and pets and vacations and stuff. I'm like, cool. Well, what if I come down and delete all the photos off your phone? And everyone freaks out, right? Like, why? don't be so mean. Why would you do that? I'm like, well, you can't touch those. But you'd argue there's not only sentimental, but possibly even financial value to those, right? So the first step is getting people over the fact that digital assets are valuable. They think about it in terms of houses and cars and even baseball cards. But even a baseball card is a card with some, some ink on it. It doesn't have value except for what we assign to it. Digital assets no different and the day that um, we can have everything accessible on that blockchain universally is going to change how we live. I mean, we came from humble beginnings. My mom doesn't really know how old she is because we don't have her birth certificate. That would be fractions of a cent on some of these chains to put on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. 
like how valuable is that in game changing? So the funniest thing is first, like don't people use it to sell drugs and I can't touch it. And once you get them past that and we use use cases of did my ballot count for that election? Birth certificates, land deeds of, you know, countries that have gone through strife. I mean, possibilities are endless. Even when I'm interviewing someone and I'm looking at a resume, I don't have to try to fax a request to their registrar to get a copy of their transcript to see if they went to that school. You should just have a PO app from the places you worked and the places you went to school and the places you've been. Right. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. I think one of the interesting things, right, is like when I talk about digital ownership to somebody over the age of 30, it, it's harder for them to understand, right? Sure. Because they come from that digital world. But you talk to anybody under the age of 18, they get it instantaneously, right? Totally. Because they've been playing video games, like very interactive video games on Roblox, on Minecraft. And, yep. you know, even when I talk to my friends and their kids for Christmas, for their birthdays, they don't want money. They don't want clothes. They don't want to, they want like V bucks uh, or like for Fortnite or Love like, it. I don't even know, Roblox, Ro Roblox bucks for Robux, right? And, totally. and so it's like all these things is like, so I think over time we're gonna be getting there because uh, the younger generation understands it inherently, intuitively. And it's really just about the education of you know, their parents and helping them yep. understand for the same way that I think um, our parents, because we grew up in a generation where my parents were like, oh, why do you need to buy that branded t-shirt? Like, you know, here's this cheaper t-shirt that also covers you up. And you were like, no, but mom, like, you don't understand. Like, this is a, you know, my favorite brand. Right. And like right. the way our parents didn't understand that, I think that that's what's happening right now uh, with parents that have kids that are like, oh, I totally understand digital ownership. Uh, and we it, like, it's about educating the parents right now. Yeah, for sure, because they're often the ones that are holding the wallets that yeah. enable some of this or the security, which is actually a good thing. But the education has to happen all around because it's not just out of altruism that we're doing this. If we still have to convert crypto back to fiat to buy a burger or pay rent, this whole thing implodes. It's just another security. So if we don't do it out of altruism, let's do it out of self-preservation, because only then can we actually actualize the potential of this. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love this one. Bullish homie asks G Money, how do you manage the success you have had while staying driven without getting complacent? Because you've crushed it. You could just be <laughs> chilling and you are not chilling. Um, yeah, I, I think one of my things is I, I originally had a number that I wanted to hit and I blew past that number. Oh and my God. At, how did that feel? It, it was great, right? Because it was like very, like it was a number that I thought was aspirational at the time. I blew past it and I was like, all right, now what's next, right? Cause it's like, what what else can I do? And at, at that point it's like, how can I help other people? And how can I just become an evangelist for NFTs? Because I think NFTs yeah. are the Trojan host, horse that take crypto mainstream. Yep. And I think crypto is just so important to human freedom, like, mm -hmm. you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 years from now that like we want to get it as pervasive as we possibly can. And so at that like at that point I was like, all right, well, like let me start focusing on that. Right. And it's not necessarily about the money for me anymore. It's more about how can I help the cause go further and do what I can, right? Like I'm not a developer, right? So I can't sit in front of the screen and code. But I think one of the things I am really good at is being able to understand what like a developer is telling me and be like, okay, like that's how this can be applied in X, Y, Z situations, but then also explain it in like layman's terms so that I can help explain it to other people, right? I think that was like what I did with my Twitter thread when I originally bought my punk is yep, like, I remember hey, that. you guys don't understand it and this is why I did it, right? And then I think it really started that conversation where people were like, oh, okay. And like, even now, like sometimes when I'm, I'm talking to people and they're like, all right, well, I understand NFTs now. I wouldn't buy one, but I might. I understand why you might buy one. And that's like the first step, Huge. right? And then it's like, then at some point, they're going to have some experience in their life where they're like, oh, okay, now it makes sense, right? And then they'll they'll go down the rabbit hole. But that, that to me has been um, really like what's been my driving force. And it's like, how can I just increase the adoption and be an, am an evangelist for the industry? I think that's why naturally we get along well, because when I was in the corporate world, my goal wasn't maybe a number, but it was a, a profession or a, a ladder rank. Mm -hmm. And I arguably had a pretty good corporate career. And then when I left, I was like, 
what am I doing? What's my purpose in life? And I discovered through some work that it's about helping people, democratizing information, access, and opportunity about anything I'm curious about, whether it's summiting mountains and red carpets or this crazy, fun blockchain NFT space. So I think when you find people who have similar values that align, it's just really easy to work together. And in corporate, I arguably worked hard. I'd work the 40-hour, 60-hour, 80-hour week. Now I work seven days a week, 18 hours a day. I don't even know where work and play start, Mm -hmm. stop, and end. It's beautiful. You get to build with, you get to literally build the future we want to live in with the dopest people. Right. So for me, I think I did get complacent at the end of corporate, which is why I left. Now I literally feel like a kid right out of college starting all over again. Like how much of a gift is that? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree, right? It's like I'm working the hardest I've worked. Totally. De- like a decade plus. We should be chilling. <laughs> and, and like I'm sitting there and I'm like, it's not work to me. And one mm-hmm. of the things that like I keep telling people, I'm, I'm going to keep doing it until I, it's not fun anymore. And the second it stops being fun, I'm like, all right, then I'm going to decide what I want to do. Mm. But until then, you know, even though I'm working as hard as I've ever had in my life, when I'd be like, oh, like I always imagine myself just like sitting back and chilling. I'm like, no, like because it's fun and it's yeah. exciting. And like I, I really enjoy what I'm doing. I took half a day off recently and then I went and just bought NFTs. I'm like, <laughs> wait, so this is fun, right? And so I would argue that there have probably been moments where we felt like that thing we were doing, which is probably chasing mints, wasn't fun anymore. So then we pivoted. Now we're building solutions. We're partnering with technology builders and building solutions for the industry, changing how people think, educating. So there's even pivots within it. So Suki2009 asks, how can Web3 bring positive changes for women in society? Women are the life force of society. If they're not happy and producing we don't have future generations <laughs> and women often in households make a lot of the financial decisions so if we're not bringing them into a new language and capability then we're leaving out not just because it's the wrong thing to do but we're leaving out people who actually make fundamental decisions that advance society forward and so it's obviously something we have to do i don't even have to evangelize it but the things that happen day to day are tough like at a conference last year because some of the men bailed, it was three women on stage, which is pretty cool for an NFT conference. The moderator let us introduce ourselves, then brought three white men from the audience to speak about the topic on their own opinions for the rest of the time. They took the microphones away from us. That's absurd. Mm-hmm. So if not for the future promise, fixing injustices like this, because imagine if that's your best friend, that's your daughter, that's your cousin. like. That's not okay regardless of what gender or race you are, right? You're put on stage as an expert to opine. Why would you take someone in real time off that stage and give the mic to other people? So there's a whole spectrum of ways to do it, but a diverse subset of customers makes the whole thing better. I don't think we have to evangelize that any further. No, and I agree with you. And to take that one step further of building on what you just said is, you know, everybody has a mother. Right. Like, totally. you know, what I mean, so it's like, why wouldn't you want to one, give future mothers that opportunity, but then also to teach their sons and daughters, like, you know, as they're coming up about this technology that, you know, could change their lives and change is is better for everybody. Totally. I think we have a terrible issue in this country of financial literacy. Way back in the day, women took home ec and men took wood shop, mm. arguably super outdated. I would think that those should have been replaced with financial literacy, balancing a checkbook, which we don't even have anymore. But like how to think about interest rates or credit card debt that should be taught in high school. No, there's always that. uh, I mean, I'm sure you see it, that meme, right, where it's like, thanks, like it's tax season. I don't know how to do my taxes, but like, yeah, I know what a a parallelogram is. Right. Like, (laughs) you know, it's like stuff like that where it's like, you know, there's a lot of things when you go back, you're like, yeah, I wish I just like knew how to fill out a 1040. Right. So that I don't need to go to, uh, you know, some some tax preparer to do it all like every single year. And right? who even knows what goes into it? But arguably, crypto and NFTs are in a way Trojan horsing education and financial literacy, because by doing that, people are asking, well, how much of my assets should right. be in this? Yep. How do I think about returns? How do you know? Mm-hmm. So in a way, I think it's actually developing financial literacy for people who may not have had access or had the luxury of spending time on it. And hopefully that can be the Trojan horse for bringing this to everyone. Right. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, so, yeah, so you already usually towards the end of the the, pro, the podcast, I usually ask what your favorite NFT is. We already covered that. So I would love to know, do you have any plans for your future, for your own future project? 
It's such a good question. I, I've been asked every week for the past year. Hmm. I would love to do it, but it's starting a company. I tell people all the time, all the roadmap to Mint, that's the prep. When you mint is when the birth of your company happens. You have customers and shareholders. So for me, that's such an immense responsibility. I want to make sure that I'm really ready to take on a forever company at that point. That's what a project is to me because I owe my shareholders. So with that, I'm taking the methodical time to think through, do I have the capacity? Do I have the right team? But then what is it, right? Is it a PFP project? Is it a membership? Is it, you know, a look into our world? I don't know what that mechanism is, but at some point I probably will. It may not be a 10,000 generative piece. I don't know. I would love to be able to do it and actually play with different mechanisms of inspiring different types of behavior, inspiring holding, not as just a staking, but like, are there different ways to put different mechanisms in there? I'd love it to be also a bunch of partnerships with people I'd love to build with. Um, but I don't know what that looks like yet. Right. It's going to be there at some point, but there's no urgency. Right now, I'm just having fun learning and developing with everyone else, but we'll see. Awesome. I'm very much looking forward to it. I can't wait. Someday. But yeah, Swan, thank you for taking the time. I know it's been a busy, crazy, hectic uh, weekend already, and it's another week. So uh, for those in the audience that want to get more information about you, where should they go? Swan sit on Instagram and Twitter and Swan on Clubhouse. Awesome. Thank you, Swan. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you. This is such a highlight and an honor. I love this. Awesome.